Praise God. Anybody just feel good in your spirit? I mean, you just feel peace. Nobody? Anybody? Wave your hand if you, you kind of just feel peace in your spirit. That's God. Because you can, you can attest, or you can be seated for a moment. You can attest that with a time in your life you didn't have this. And it's only God's goodness that has allowed that. He is so good to us. And uh, uh, we have this church, his messages, as you, some of you are going to attest, it seems like for a, a long time the Lord has just been digging and digging and digging. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And it's digging and digging. But like I said, I think something just changed the other day. And, and he's preparing us. And so I want to encourage us in the word of the Lord. Anybody need courage this morning? And just bring everything really into perspective. And uh, I may not get any louder than this, and that's all right. Praise God. But I want you to absorb the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, clear your mind. Uh, if there's things going on, put it on the back burner. Let the word of God marinate in your brain and in your thinking and in your heart. And you will feel a whole lot better when you leave with a greater determination. That's what it's all about. And we do this uh, until Jesus comes back or we go by the grave. Because I promise you, when you get to heaven, it's more glorious than we could ever imagine. But I know we have life to live, but that's what church is about, and the word of the Lord is going to help us. In the eighth psalm, I want to read this out of the King James, and it's uh, nine verses. Uh, David wrote this. This is the uh, eighth psalm. Uh, I can't read that, so I'll read out of here. Can anybody, it's kind of dark, kind of a bright background, Sister Clark. Oh, yeah, we can read that one. In fact, let's read it together. We'll read it kind of. That's easy to read. Oh, yes. No, I wanted it in the King James, Sister Clark. Did I put easy to read on that? How long will it take you? Okay. Isn't this good? I'll tell you, even just sitting in the presence of God in his house is better than being out there in that, whatever that is, that we used to be a part of just... Mm -hmm doggy dog world and can't trust anybody and everybody's uh, uh, follows the tactics of the devil which is an imitator and manipulator he tries to imitate god appear as god and then manipulate you i'm telling you that's not of god he never forced himself on anybody holler at me when you get it sister clark it's still easy to read you know i don't even feel bad about this it was a time you almost feel like, you, you, you know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And that's why we can feel no, no problem, no nothing. Of course, we go for 30 minutes, but uh, are you getting close, sis? Praise God. Anybody got a quick testimony? Nobody? Y'all awful quiet. Praise God. Well, maybe I need to read it. You about there? This is what they would call a commercial break. Praise God. This is all right. The Lord knows what he's doing. Well, maybe we need to sing another song. Maybe while she's doing it. Somebody holler when she gets to King James up there. That was quick. Okay, let's all read this together. Can we do that? <clears throat> O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, all the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. 
O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Anybody believe that? His name. David started verse 1 with that. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. And he ended the same way. How excellent is thy name. I want to read, we're going to focus on verse 3 and 4. And I want to read this out of the easy to read. Uh, we read it out of the King James. Uh, King James says, O Lord my God. No, he says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained or created. That's what that means. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have created. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? The easier read says it like this. I look at the heavens you made with your hands. I see the moon and the stars you created. And I wonder, why are people so important to you? Why do you even think about them? Why do you care so much about humans? Why do you even notice them? But this was written by David, and I imagine some of the things he uh, penned when he wrote. Uh, in fact, let me plug Next Gen again for some reason. These are encouraging words. This man wrote this thousands of years ago. He had no idea we would be reading his word today. That's how powerful words that are anointed can affect somebody. So anyway, keep that in mind. I would, wouldn't be surprised if David was attributing this scripture when he was a shepherd boy tending daddy's sheep, just tending the, the flock, that he would have a lot of lonely nights by himself. The sheep were going to bed, and he's just looking out at the stars, the moon, and, and he couldn't comprehend like we know today. Science has given us a lot of insight to God and his power. He didn't have what we have today. And so he wonders, and, 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 and he made that statement. He said, I, I wonder why are people so important to you, God? And why do you even think about us? And why do you care so much about us? And why do you even notice us? Let's talk about that for a moment. He said he considered the heavens in verse 3. To consider the heavens. He looked and saw the skill that was involved in all this, ladies and gentlemen. The moon, the heavens, the stars, the earth, everything is just as it needs to be. We're spinning, how fast are we spin? Real fast. We're not spinning too fast or we'd fly off. We're not spinning too slow. God's got everything in control. And the point he's getting at, God is so powerful, so majestic. Everything is in order. He's got everything in control. He can do whatever he needs to do. And all we see is our limited uh, what, telescopes and, and our knowledge we have. He goes so much farther than that, way out there. And let's admit, this is one glorious God, is it not? This is one powerful God, is it not? This is one God that he doesn't like things that are undone, and he will not leave anything unfinished. He likes things like when creation, he did this on the first day, and it was good. He likes to say, Pat, when he puts his stamp on something, it's good. This earth is good. Everything's going like it needs to go. The moon is shining and reflecting like it needs to. The stars are hanging like they need to. And he looks out, and we can look out and say, God, you're so majestic, and your skill that is involved in making this. And I look at that. And then the work of your fingers. Fingers are used to create wonderful things. Sculptures. People are talented with their drawing ability. Those that do calligraphy, I... My penmanship is the worst you've ever seen. I'll attest to that. I cannot write. God, with his fingers, he created a beautiful piece of work, a great skill. God did this with his fingers. Look what Psalms 147, verses 1 through 5, and the easy to read says. Starts verse 1. Praise the Lord because he is good. 
Right there is enough to praise God. And sing praises to our God. It is good and pleasant to praise Him. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He brings back the Israelites who were taken as prisoners. And I'm glad I will, I will inject this. This was written uh, thousands of years ago. I'm glad in the New Testament He has delivered us from the one that rules this world. That will make anybody happy right there. Some of us had things we're not proud of. We all have things we're not proud of. But we just realize God's helping us get through that. But look at that. He heals their broken hearts and bandages their wounds. Has He not done that to us? And look at verse 4. He counts the stars, Andrew Bohannon. He counts the stars and knows each of them by name. Now, folks, will you attest and believe with me that it's bigger than our Milky Way galaxy? <laughs> that is a speck in where God really is everywhere. There's universes, there's things. Crystal, we don't even know how big this is. So let's just zero in on what we do know. Like it's been said, there's so much more we don't know than we do know. Just in the Milky Way, got this little bitty teeny tiny speck, he has numbered and named over 100 billion stars. He's got a good name, a good memory, and a whole lot of names. Sister Francis, he knows every one of them and named them. We're talking about, you got to catch this. You got to catch how majestic this God is. That's why he said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are so much higher. I I'm on a level that you can't really understand. We really can't. We trust him and we believe him by faith. But these stars in the galaxy, and then in verse 5, our Lord is great and powerful. There is no limit to what he knows. That's a powerful God. So powerful, that's what David was getting at. And that's why I want us to understand this morning. Get first. Do you agree that this is one great, big, powerful God? And he lives in a realm that is way out there, folks. And so David is saying, and all of us have wondered, why are you concerned about me? I'm so insignificant. I failed God many, many times. I've let him down. All I want to do, my flesh just wants to do what my flesh wants to do continually. I'm always dropping the ball. Why do you even think about man when, oh, when you're way out there like that? Why? Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because God loves his creation. He puts something in us, ladies and gentlemen. We are a masterpiece of God. You think he's not so powerful? There's what, 8 billion people on the earth and how many have died since they've been, since creation? And all of us, for the most part, have two eyes and nose, a mouth and two ears. And yet we're all so different. One little change in our DNA makes us different. Think about that. This is a really magnificent God that did all this, folks. And just like, why would he even think about us? Why would you even be concerned about me? Let me tell you what God thinks about us. He said, verse 4, why are you even mindful? That means, why do you even remember us? That's what it means, to be mindful. He remembers. He thinks on man. God remembers us and thinks about us. How could he? He's so far, he's out there in a realm that is unbelievable to us. We can't even imagine and comprehend. Why would that God want to think about us? He does. And you think and you have problems and this life is whatever, and the things we go through, you need to keep these scriptures in mind. God is thinking about you. And he's got plans for you. Every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, he's got plans for you. But you, he's got to seal up 
and wrap up this thing called sin. Like I said, he leaves nothing undone. He's wrapping up the sin problem and he's going to make the separation. Those that are born again, those that are believers, they're going to go to a good place. Those that refused it, wanted their own thing, rejected God, are going to their place. He's going to seal up time. He's going to destroy this earth and he's going to carry on. That's it in a nutshell. I'm glad he had mercy on us and continues to have mercy on us. God is faithful to forgive our sins. That's what it says. That means it's not a license to sin every day, all day long. That means however many times you sin, he's faithful to forgive you. And it comes to a point where you realize, God, I got to quit doing what I kept doing because I don't like this. It's, it's not, I, I need to grow up. <laughs> I need a spirit to grow up. Again, it's not a license to sin. But he said it's faithful. That means he will continually. And then he's trusting and believing. And probably every one of us, truth be known, when we come to God, we had a lot of issues a lot of things we wrestled with. And a lot of things we kept going back to God over the things we failed Him. You don't have to wave your hand. I know what I'm talking about. I've said all of us. But there came a time where He gave us victory over that. It's like something changed. God, I'm going to quit doing that. I appreciate your faithfulness. I appreciate the blood. I appreciate you covering my sin. But I need to grow up and get over that. Because you can't keep looking at love till love will start affecting you. Somebody say amen. He said, I remember. He, he thinks about. He will attend to. A man does never escape his thoughts. This is what that word means. With all the glorious heavens, God, that you have and everywhere you could go and people that have not messed up and angels that are following you. and every, Why us? You ever thought about that? Why? Instead of, God, you owe me, we need to be thinking, God, why me? We don't deserve this, ladies and gentlemen. And until somebody can come to God in that attitude, I don't deserve it, but I'm not going to be denied what God has. And I'm going to live for him in humility, knowing that he is great and powerful, and I am mere man, but he loves me. And cares for me. And we live under the grace. Praise God. And you will visit man. He thinks about us. But then he will visit us. It's one thing to say. Yeah I thought about coming by. But I didn't. <laughs> Be like say you know. Uh, uh, Tony I'm thinking about. Uh, taking you to. do uh, What's that Italian place? Napoleon? Yeah. Tony I'm thinking about it. But I'm not going to do it. That's not quite the same. Oh, I thought about him. Or this afternoon about one o'clock, drive by and go by your house and say, hey, Tony, let's go eat. That's a whole different ball game. He thinks about his sister Hope, but not only that, he visits us. I want us to get this. Crystal, he's so far out there. And things that he can create that will never fail him. Things that will never let him down, Brother Brimer. Folks, this is not a message to beat yourself up. This is a message to get things in perspective. That God that created all this, my friend, thinks about me. Doesn't that encourage you? Doesn't that make you want to do what's right and please him and live a life of appreciation? And sometimes that's why we sing these songs of Zion. I, he, the Lord, everything that had breath should praise him. And it does. Things praise him. But I am convinced the Lord, nobody can sing the songs of Zion like the bride. There's a lot of people, a lot of groups, they sing Christian songs, so to speak. And if they're not the bride of Christ, I'm sure he enjoys it, but it's not the same. I've used that illustration 
before is somebody saying, Brother Clark, we appreciate you. I love you. And I appreciate the words, but it has not has a lot more impact when it comes from my wife. And she gets right up in my face with them baby browns. <laughs> And that big old smile, and I just love you, big boy. That go that that just does something. And when the children of God, Sister Hubbard, that are born again with an understanding, sing songs of praise to the Lord, that's his bride, that does something to him. Don't ever quit singing the songs of Zion Church. He said that word visit is is, a, is a, the Hebrew word pawkod. That means with great attention and care. He is not forgetting or ever leaving or ever passing by us. He thinks about us, not only thinks, but he visits us. That word visitation means for any purpose. Hallelujah. And a visitation, this is what's neat about the New Testament, a visitation can go to a habitation. He can visit us And then we can also let him live inside of us. You talk about, are you catching this? Did you see this segue? How great this God is. I mean, you understand, he's big and he's glorious. And it's like, Mike, we can think we can't ever get on his level, but he does visit us. And this is something that is available. You need to get that bulldog determination. I'm not going to be denied everything's God got. And now let's take it the next step that God can live in us. Doesn't that make you kind of feel like, wow. (laughs) I mean, wow. That's why the bride of Christ, when they go into the, to heaven, the angels stand aside and welcome him. Just like the bride walks down the aisle. Everybody stands up and turns her head. Here comes the bride. The angels desired to look into us. They probably had the same question. God, (laughs) read it's what it says. They desire to look in us. Why are we? God? (laughs) Uh, God? (laughs) Them? But he had a plan. He doesn't share his plan with everybody. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He knows what he's doing. Hallelujah. He is getting a bride. He's got everything that will do his bidding. He just creates. He just speaks it and it happens. But somebody that's got a soul that will never die, meaning basically you have ability to make choices that God will respect. Either good choices or bad choices. We covered that the other night. He will respect your choices. He respects them. And we carried that for those that weren't able to be here. We respect people that make choices. We don't judge them, criticize them, or make fun of them. That's their choice. We respect that. And God respects our choices. But when he finds people that will choose to serve and love him that's never seen him, he's got rewards for those people. I want it. Anybody want it? He is mindful about us. And that habitation, 1 John says, greater is he that is in you. And he said, I want to sink in. We went from how great he is, and we all agree he's beyond our comprehension, and yet he does think about us. And now we'll take the next step. He can live in us. Praise God. And Ephesians 3, Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. Let me inject this. It was said at the meeting, the Woodward made this statement. It's so powerful. I, I was sharing with somebody yesterday that called and I was talking on the phone. And <clears throat> understand this, ladies and gentlemen. We go through things and understand God allows things to happen. If the devil is working on you, attacking you with either finances, your health, your family, Whatever it is, understand what he's really after is your faith. He's after your faith. Yeah, where's that God I thought about? And get you to make a bad choice. That bad choice would be 
turn your back and question God, that is what we call a foothold, making room for the devil. And if you don't deal with that real quick, it will become a stronghold. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't ever question God. Ladies and gentlemen, God cannot, will not, ever make a mistake. We may not understand it, but Crystal, he is perfect, righteous, just. He can't make it if he wanted to. Praise God. But a lot of things, now if we're doing all we can do, sometimes we have things that are our choice. But I'm talking about you're doing all you know to do, and he has attacked people. He's attacking people constantly. But it's not so much your health. It's not so much your finances. It's not so much the family members. He wants you to attack your faith and question God. Somebody needs to leave here today with great encouragement. My God, I'm in your control. I'm in your hands. You protect me. You keep me. You're good to me. You will never let me down. I'm held in the hollow of your hand. And the devil can't snatch me out of your hand, it says in the Gospels. He can't do that. We need his protection. Christ dwells in our hearts. How? Through you don't know my circumstance, so I'll let this shift to James. We walk by, not by circumstance or sight. Don't ever let your faith dwindle. And we all need encouragement from faith. They say in the New Testament, Sister Howard, Lord, I believe I just need some help believing more. So maybe the word of the Lord, if you're going through things and your faith is being questioned, maybe the Lord will increase your faith through his word today. Praise God. Galatians 2, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Praise God, that great God living in us, the hope of glory. So through all of our reasoning, I've only got about five or ten more minutes. Boy, I felt a surge of faith in that. I've talk, I talked to these guys. My, the, the, with my sister and him going to Indiana, I mentioned it to those guys the other, night, the other day, and, and I, they, they said that the church to go to Indianapolis from there, he never preaches over 20 minutes. So one of the, one of the ministers there last Monday, and I confessed about my long windedness, and he said, I only preached 20 minutes yesterday morning, and I'm thinking... But like I said, I feel bad in the flesh, but my spirit doesn't. We're all right. Anyway, get off of that. So through all of our reasoning to try to reason things out, through all of our science that mankind has come up with, I kind of, through all we can, whatever you're going through something this morning and you don't understand, through all of your questions and trying to reason things and figure things out, hear me, at the end of all that is God. If you would tap into that and bypass our little problems and leap over into the God area through all excuses and hurts and I can't do this, I can't do that, I've let God down. That is no excuse. You need to go through all of that and say there's a God that is greater than my problems. I'm talking about this God that David looked at and says, how in the world, God? And hear me, hear me. That's why I preached it the other day and I'll preach it again. People that go to hell, the worst thing in hell is flames is bad. That would hurt for eternity, Sister Francis. But I concur 100% with this statement. The worst thing about hell is the absence of God for an eternity. Well, I don't believe that. We, even the atheists, are enjoying the blessings of God right now. They enjoy his, it rains on the just and the unjust. The atheists are enjoying the blessings of God, the temperature, the weather. They can grow things. They can live. They can make money. That is a blessing of God. Hell, understand, hell is the absence of God. Wow. Wow. 
I don't want to go there. Does anybody want to go there? That's the worst part about it. But what I'm saying, my point, is we can have this God that David saw. And he will be so concerned about He wants to be involved with so much of what we do. Do you not want to be involved in things that your kids do? Your grandkids do? How many, how many kids do things, curriculum, extra things at school, and, and they just wish mom and my dad could be there or my mom could be there and they're there all by themselves? I'm sure that crushes them kids. And that's one thing in life. And that's things that we may live with and may change as time goes on and realize. But when you carry that into the realm of God and His creation, we need to give God His just praise and thankfulness and understand He wants to be mindful and visit us in our dilemmas. Somebody needs to believe that this morning. He is mindful of you. Where you at, God? I looked to the right, looked to the left, looked everywhere, couldn't seem to find him. He is right here all the time. We're trying to find him in other things. Again, when you look out of all this, God's outside of it. We're in this realm of, of, of our dilemma. God's outside the dilemma. Somebody say amen. Our questions, our mistakes, our unbelief. And I'm closing real quickly. Job 7 and 17, he mentioned this. Job says in the Amplified, he says that's funny. Oh, I did give you both. I'm sorry, I gave you King James, Amplified, and easy to read. She's, back. She's right. In the King James it says, what is man? This is another writer. This isn't David. This is another one. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him? And that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him? I really want everybody to catch this. This God of great power, understand, he cares about you. How much does he care? I'm going to tell you how much that God cared. He put on flesh his own son and hung on a cross for us. If that ain't love, in fact, I wish we knew this song. I was going to call somebody and see if they knew that song, and, and I looked it up on YouTube. It's Who Am I? Do you know that, Sister Hubbard? Who am I that a king? Here in a few moments, would you be able to sing that or help us? She will try. That's what's so neat about that. I'll just try. That is so cool. That song, I'm going to tell you some of the words. Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Let it, let it resound when we, when we have our problems and we go through these things and, and maybe hopefully nobody is a woe as me today. Sometimes we get like that. But listen to that. That's the, that's the King James. Listen to the Amplified. What is man that you should magnify him and think him important? I'm going to tell you something. Every one of you, you're important to God. And that you are concerned about him Where's God at? How come I'm having so many problems? It's called life, and it's called growing up in God, and it's called maturity, just like in the natural. He wants us to grow. It's easy to read. I like this. Job 7. Job is saying this now. It says, God, why are people so important to you? Why do you even notice them? Now, you can, you can change your... You can, you can think... Oh, I'm nothing, I'm insignificant. If you want to live in that concept, I'm asking every one of us to turn that around, not in an ego or a proud, but say, God notices me. I want my affirmation from God and not mankind. We all need affirmation. We all need to feel good. We all need to be encouraged. But I'm telling you, like David said, I encourage myself in the Lord. Don't just seek man to build you up and encourage you. Seek it from God. That's what that means. The words of the Lord today are encouraging every one of us. How encouraging is that? This God thinks about you. How much more affirmation do you need? He's mindful of us. 
Genesis 21, I'm closing with this, and I'm going to read something they're going to lead, or sing in the lead. This is, this is uh, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to go kind of backwards. I'm reading 21, 1 through 3. It says, The Lord came back to visit Sarah as he said he would. God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. Jesus said, I'm coming back. Guess what? You're going to come back. He came, so he kept his promise to her at exactly the time God said it would happen. Sarah became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. Abraham named him Isaac. Let's go back three chapters. What's that talking about? I want to read this. And thank you for the music, Sister Hubbard. Just keep, that's beautiful. Uh, so chapter 18 of Genesis, this is what that's talking about. Verse 1, later, the Lord again appeared to Abraham near the oak tree of Mamre. It was the hottest part of the day. And, and Abraham was sitting at the door of his tent. Verse 2. Verse 2. He looked up and saw three men standing in front of him. When he saw the men, he ran to them and bowed before them. Abraham said, Sir, please stay a while with me, your servant. I will bring you some water to wash your feet, and you can rest under the tree. I'll get you some food for you, and you can eat as much as you want. Then you can continue your journey. The three men said, do as you wish. Abraham hurried to the tent. He said to Sarah, quickly, prepare enough flour for three loaves of bread. Then Abraham ran to his cattle. He took his best young calf and gave it to the servant there. He told the servant to quickly kill the calf and prepare it for food. Abraham brought the meat and some milk and cheese and set them down in front of the three men. Then he stood near the men ready to serve them while they sat under the tree and ate. The men said to Abraham, where's your wife, Sarah? Abraham said, she is there in the tent. Then one of them said, I'm going to come again in the spring. At that time, your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, folks, she's 90 years old. <laughs> Sarah was listening in the tent and heard these things. Abraham and Sarah were very old. Sarah was past the age for women to have children. So what she do? She laughed. She laughed to herself and said, I'm old and my husband is old. I'm too old to have a baby. The Lord said to Abraham, Sarah laughed and said, she was too old to have a baby. But is anything too hard for the Lord? I want to finish reading here a couple more verses. Let that sink in to somebody today. You may think it's over. You may think I can't get through this. You may think I've gone too far. You may think I, I, whatever, whatever, whatever. Beyond all of those reasoning and questions, at the end of all that is God wanting to help you because he's interested in you. And you got to understand and you got to believe nothing is too hard for God. I will come again in the spring just as I said I would and your wife is going to have a son. Sarah said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> she said this because she was afraid. And the Lord said, no, I know it's not true. You did laugh. <laughs> Don't lie to God. <laughs> she lied. <laughs> I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. Okay. Then the men got up to leave. They looked towards Sodom again, walking in the direction. Abraham walked with them to send them their way. Then that's where I read, God came back like he said he would in the spring. And she had that baby because he said, I visited her. That's what it said. I visited her from the promises that he says is going to happen. If God has given you promises, ladies and gentlemen, you need to hold to them. He will come and visit you at the right time and bring that promise to pass. Individually, collectively as churches. Somebody say, praise God. He's faithful, merciful, and coming back. So, how does that happen? Last scripture, Matthew 23, 37. Easy to read. Jesus is talking. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You killed the prophets. You stoned to death those that God has sent to you. Many, many times I wanted to help your people. I wanted to gather them together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But why did it not happen? You didn't let him. I'm encouraging everyone. As we stand this morning, 
I'm encouraging us, if we could, just to kind of gather around the front of the church. We want to sing this song. The Lord wants me to just remind some people today. He knows where we're at. And if you could ever get over the who am I to who am I, and I am not going to be denied what I can have in God in the right attitude because he's good. I don't deserve it. No, but I'm not going to live in that the rest of my life. I'm going to look at it in the right attitude. God, you are God and you do visit and are mindful and care and will help and protect and save us. I've got to have that in the right attitude. I don't deserve it, but I'm going to get it because you're good. And I'm gonna, when you do it in the right attitude, I'm telling you, God is pleased. Because he can tell when it's a motive that is ulterior, and he can tell when you really mean it.